<laughs> Welcome. Okay, so uh, this February and March I traveled to uh, Sydney and Bali under the auspice of IPCCR and uh, trying to uh, further my collaboration and create liaisons. Uh, I want to visit schools and art centers, develop contacts. I visit theaters and festivals of local and professional talent that include a range of productions, workshops, talks with artists. Uh, my main meeting was with Professor Cheryl Stock, a PhD. She's the Director of Graduate Studies, Head of Cultural Leadership at NIDA, National Institute of Dramatic Arts. Australia's leading performing arts school, and its graduates are highly regarded throughout the creative and entertainment industry. We discussed how to move forward with meaningful cultural collaborative relationships. Uh, recently, NIDA started a one-of-a-kind MFA in cultural leadership. We discussed the synergies between arts and programs, approaches, and we'll find ways to help facilitate contact for our international placements. We also studied, uh, discussed study abroad possibilities with our students through participation in one or two intensives that may work well. The international placement is a unique opportunity to, depend, uh, to deepen knowledge and frame of experience through an immersive period of work experience overseas. So basically, uh, National, Institute, uh, National Institute of Dramatic Arts is kind of like their Yale, Harvard of all performing. In the Sydney, you have NIDA. On the West Coast, you have WAPA, which is Western Australian Performing Arts. All the musical theater people go to WAPA. All the rest of the people go to NIDA for the theater dance scholarship. Uh, NIDA would be the people that Kate Blanchett, uh, Boz Lerman, Mel Gibson, back before <laughs> Mel Gibson, all went there. I've been there before in my travels when I was doing study abroad, and I saw that they were doing a cultural leadership MFA. It's the only one in the world. So I thought that we might have, I was talking to uh, Professor Strzok, back and forth over then she said, oh, we'd love to have a school and people that we could partnership because they do it all through Australia, but they don't have the American uh, collaboration, which she thought, and looking at our schools, what we should be able to do. So I met with her for a week and went to some of the classes, and I'm going to share with you a little bit about what they do with their Master of Fine Arts. Uh, thinking both for uh, graduate students and undergraduate students. For the graduate students, you can think that they could do one of their intensives. Uh, as a postdoc, they might be thinking of it. There might be a semester abroad if they wanted to go across. She's willing to work in any way. Also to bring their students over here to our organization so they can see how we do it here in the United States. If you think of cultural leadership, no one really does that. You go into an, so they, so if you go to arena stage, I have some students who've done internships that go, this wasn't the best opportunity for me as a person of color. They do their black shows, but that's it. And they're not where they end a living stage. So if you know that, how do you go and bridge that? And so, okay, I'm here. I've done this cultural leadership. I can either change the culture or not be part of this culture as opposed to sitting there, I'm stuck here. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of students that all of a sudden they're stuck in an internship and they go, I'm never going to go back there again. Mm -hmm. You're sitting in a theater and you realize, oh, I'm one person of color at an unnamed theater in Virginia, and this is the fourth show that I've seen this way. What has happened with their culture of leadership that they don't have any culture of diversity and inclusion? And mm -hmm. we know now, the more, look at this wonderful group that we have right here. This is a much better learning experience and outcomes that you will have with any inclusion because they say, why are you doing inclusion diversity? Well, this is why. So we'll take a look at, uh, this is their cultural, and this, and the great thing was they had just started their first cohort. So at the very beginning of this program right now. So I was able to see what they're doing, what they would like to improve on, and she gave me about four courses that she thought would be the best if we were doing some sort of uh, cultural exchange. And then also, if we want to steal any of their programs <laughs> themselves. So she was nice enough to give me their syllabus. So a uh, little thing for ourselves, uh, what they're looking for. They need leaders with understanding of cultural policy and entrepreneurial and advocacy skills to drive the cultural sectors. Empathetic leaders with vision and passion who are generous, collaborative, and courageous. Usually you'll have an arts management course, but it doesn't speak any of that. So you either have business people going to theater or theater people that are going into business, but it's really not the same. So they're going, what do you do here? We connect with practitioners and 
there we go. Uh, unique course approach. Neither a university-based arts management degree nor a predominantly business-based leadership course designed for long-term professional embedded learning. Balancing the upgrading of essential skills alongside stimuli for visionary approaches, cultural leadership team has devised a program that invites deep individual and shared critical analysis through case studies and expert speakers. As opposed to one or the other, how do we put them together? And who should apply? And once again, it's mid-career producers, directors, and managers working full-time in the cultural sectors. So once again, the same with our programs, you want to have had enough of a skill set to know the gap that you need to fill for this. Forming arts, theater art, museum, galleries, libraries, local organizations, government. All right, educating new leaders. We talked about that. They talk a little about the cohorts that have been there, of course, publicity for themselves. Want to get into one of the cohort feedbacks. Olivia mm -hmm. says, no, <laughs> Olivia <laughs> Allen. <laughs> Nowhere else have I been given an opportunity to speak with honesty, rigor, and passion about my experience in work in the realm of arts and culture, sharing thoughts, fears, and speculations with others who stretch and span my vision in ways impossible to imagine previously. Uh, here is Cheryl Stock, my friend, who is doing this with me. Industry leaders and night academic staff bring extensive knowledge of both practice and pedagogy. All right, and this is the way, it's very unique way that they're doing it. Oh, how can I do it? Well, you're not, you're doing most of your work away from night itself. So you do it over 30 months. You have four five-day in intensives at night at a year. So say if I want to do it, if there were five times, uh, four times that I could get away for this, I could still do it and hold down the job until I got the internship. Supporting online learning with interviews, lectures, seminars, and one-on-one -on -one support by key industry leaders. So once again, these have to be self-starters. They can't be people that you have to hold their hand through the program. Uh, they talk about course structure, assessment tax and better known industry practice with relevant uh, comparative case studies and scaffolded learning environment. Experience artist academics providing rigorous teaching, training, professional practice. Here is the perfumery, Joseph Fullerton, with Dr. Melissa Laird. She's an executive director of learning and teaching. And that's how far reaching that they're going with this. Uh, we have some feedback that we don't need to talk about. The core structure, first 12 months, cultural transformation and sustainability, leadership and government, contextualizing practice. And once again, I want to take all these courses. The next 18 months, communication and advocacy, Cultural policy and practice, generating research through practice, international placement. And that's where we all come in. And then the intensive dates. So then, it, and I, you guys can look at this, I can send you for anyone who's interested. You see how the intensive works. January, the end of January, February, April to May, August, and October. So those are the four intensive that you're actually there doing it in person. All right? And we have a little bit more feedback about what's going on, how the people liked it, what you need, an undergraduate degree, or at least five years relative professional experience in the arts cultural sector. Since a lot of people go or going into this not knowing, they're not, they don't have an MFA, they don't have a PhD already, so it's more of the experience, but they do have to have an undergraduate degree. And then it's how you apply. All right. And if you want to look more like this, and then, I'm going to, I want to go back to, if I just go backwards on this, that will get me back to my email. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, click good. that back button. This one right there, right? Yeah. Good. So All right. Do they have funding? Yes. Yeah. And, you know, once again with uh, Austria, since it's a socialized country that everybody has an education there, and everybody pretty much gets financial aid. So for them, they don't really pay for school. Mm -hmm. the way that we do, so it might be how we figure out how they would do that. Yeah, once you go there, you're real, and you've been there. It's like, everybody has an education, everybody makes about the same amount of money. You don't see homeless, and uh, all the arts are subsidized, mm -hmm. so they don't have to worry about box office. And what they do is, mm -hmm. it's a tall poppy syndrome where everyone should be at the same level. And if you're too high, they cut you down, and if you're too low, they fertilize you. And so Kate Blanchett and her and her husband's theater company, Sydney Theater Company, is probably one of the most famous because of them, they have so much money that they go, well, what do we do? Well, we'll add another theater that just anyone can use other than us, 
and we don't have anything for a building, so we're going to put a green roof on top and start farming. <laughs> what else can we do for ourselves? Uh, so this is one of the courses that I'd recommend. Leadership and Governance uh, examines models of governance within the context of cultural section. How board and executive leadership intersects with sound governance to realize organizational creative goals. Wouldn't you love to do that before you go into administration? Mm -hmm. A whole class on this. So we want to take a look at the different things on this. Uh, and once again, examination of the legal organization operational frameworks of cultural organizations investigate the perspectives of power, values, and ethics. Subject assesses, analyzes style of leadership of cultural organizations, how these cultural organizations are governed, including the role responsibility of the boards of directors and seniors in the team. <laughs> I need this, okay? Uh, please uh, stop me with any questions that you have. Here is cultural communication and advocacy, another one that we said would be a good course for everyone. Develop articulate leaders who are adept at communicating and presenting ideas within a range of settings, including workplace, conferences, large public gatherings, corporate and government events across the creative industries. Subject will also enhance effective leadership strategies in relation to advocacy and media presentations. There's that one, and the next one that I have is Contextualizing Practice, 15 CP for our scholars. Subject develop your understanding of a particular side of cultural endeavors, so what you would choose to do within the framework of a wider field of contemporary cultural enterprises. Subjects designed to facilitate engaged by arts practitioners, as well as producers, executives, and managers with the view to contextualize the practice of a wide range of creative and cultural professionals. This, love to be able to do that one. 910. Scott, can I ask you a question? Yes. Mm -hmm. What ideally would you like to do as a next step on this project? To see, once again, if there are people in the PhD program and once again in the undergraduate program that might think of later going on to a program like this. How can we facilitate that? And do you think it would be worth talking to the people over at the DeVos Institute, since they do a lot of similar yeah. stuff in their management training? Mm -hmm. Maybe we should have a meeting with them and see if we can't say, how would we integrate this? And then Is maybe what we too? could arrange is, is for the people from Australia to come and take part in the DeVos Institute. They would love that. Um, that should have a, a high prestige yeah. component for it. Um, so I don't know enough about what the DeVos Institute does, but they must be doing it well. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they're very focused on bringing people from all over the world. And this might, this might, might, might not only be an ideal relationship to build there, but they also seem to have funding yeah. for some of this. Because once again, they're looking for international placement. And once again, they could do their internship here. And, and, and then maybe... Yeah. And also the DeVos, the DeVos people have an international network of placements as well. Yeah. And so maybe you could, we could tie into that in yeah. some way so that our people and the people from Australia both could benefit from that. Yeah. So, so how soon do you want to move forward on that? Do you want to see if we can set up a meeting yeah. in the next month or so? We'll love it. All right. Yeah. I'm not sure how to do that, but I will start exploring it okay. and see if we can't find out. I would suggest that you start with Bonnie. Um, right. Uh, I've certainly tried, um, but not gotten. Uh, I've got their secretary, Bud Brett and uh, Michael's uh, secretary's uh, emails, and we can call the DeVos Institute any time. But I think writing uh, a note and saying this is what we'd like to meet about, and we'd like to have you come and talk to us, or we'd like to go. We'd talk like to Bonnie you. to come and talk to us, or we'd yeah. like the DeVos people come and talk. The DeVos, Brett and Michael. Or we can go to them. Um, but let's, let's, I'll start yeah. pursuing that. And then it Thanks. might be also like a, great idea. a meeting that I meet if the history theory folks are interested in this. See, is there something with our students if they wanted to participate after yeah. they graduate? Because yeah. I think it would be more like, as I was explaining, it's probably more of a postdoc that they have there, because I think it'd be hard for them to but do this while they were doing it. We PhD. still have to solve this problem of how we can get our graduate students to spend a semester somewhere. See, there you go. And, and, that might, and yeah. the, pro the fundamental problem, as you know, is that if they leave campus, they lose their TA share. Mm -hmm. And they can't afford that. Right. That has to be a solvable problem. Yeah. 
And and one of the things we were hoping is that we could we could just lobby the graduate school to allow them if they're doing uh, work over the internet, if yeah. they're teaching courses for us, if they're doing distance sure. learning stuff, they're still doing the work. They should be able to do that from Australia yeah. as well as doing it here. Yeah. Uh, but it is going to take a prolonged kind of campaign to get people to come to Jesus about yeah. this. Yeah. Um, all right. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, so that was uh, the first part. The second part is for more diversity opportunities and inclusion in the arts festivals. Uh, when I'd been there before and taken study abroad classes, uh, we were doing the major venues and that. So I said on this one, so let's figure out people of color. They had the whole uh, queer thinking part of their Mardi Gras. So I was able to go to some of these events and especially the Curry Gras, which I'll talk about more, but this will show you what this festival is, which is in February or March. And so here's the festival program for everything that goes on. And remember, this is the LGBTQ, so we got lots of stuff going on. Of course, we have Cher there. <laughs> <laughs> and the big parts, the Curry Gras, this is the First Nation, their whole part of the LGBT festival. So I'll uh, focus in on that, because I went to the two-day uh, symposium workshop at Carriage Works. Uh, these are parts of the queer theater festival. Strangers in Between is one of the shows that was there. And here's the Queer Thinking uh, Festival. It was a two-day of workshops that I'll uh, talk about. Uh, part of that was Trans Stories, 40 Years. Just blew my mind. They're so far ahead of what we're doing. But Sydney only got marriage equality this last year. I, it, I thought that there was marriage equality, everything that they talked about, everything you knew, and they go, oh my god, they're so forward thinking, but still, and with them, it was a ballot initiative. So they sent out ballots to everybody, you voted by ballot, and then it passed. And you know, it's also mandatory uh, voting in Australia. Everybody has to vote, or you get fined. Yeah. Uh, There's a lot of countries. Yep, exactly. Uh, the Black Nullah Workshop, that's also the People of Color First Nation workshops in the festival, the speakers flat platform, the same thing. Uh, they were doing Metamorphosis, Mary Zimmer, The View Upstairs, which is another part of the LGBT uh, theater festival, which I saw. And the last part of this, you can kind of see all, it's amazing, the whole, month where we have like one week of the LGBT mm -hmm. festivals here, they take a whole month for this. So the whole festivals. Well, they're not as busy shooting people. That's they true. Also, they, in 98, mm -hmm. they figured out the guns. You know, there's no guns there. Even police don't have guns in Australia. Mm -hmm. So if I was at a festival and a kid got drunk and the police come over, they get on their knees behind, they put their hands behind their back and they put uh, those plastic ties on their hands mm -hmm. and then they take them away. Uh, all right, and that's the activist show and tell, Change the World panel that I went to also. Same thing, Change for All Feminism and the LGBTQ movement, and activism, radicalism, radicalism from the AIDS crisis to today. Keeps on going through, so I kind of see there's nine million things that you can see at this festival. Uh, exactly. Then. So this is the big festival that I went to for the two days at the Carriage Works. And this great thing was an old carriage house in downtown uh, Sydney that they have made into a uh, open air space that could be converted however you want it to be. It's like been through the new Tate Modern, the second building of it that kind of looks like an old factory that did the same thing. So you can change it and use it however you want for dance, for theater, for art. And this was where the conference was. So you didn't feel like how it was to go to conferences and you go to a hotel and it's all sterile. Well, this is, you all feel like you're in an arts building. Uh, once again, activists change the world, change for all, queer refugees. I would love, you know, if in February, if you get a group of students or know that this is going on at this time, and even if you're doing a study abroad, which is usually, you know, the midterm, the January to February, I'm sorry, uh, December, January slot, Still, some of these things are going on that you could schedule to it, knowing that they're there. Okay, and then 
This was queer refugees building the bridges and bridging the gaps. And then, one of my favorites, this was uh, activism and rad radicalism from the AIDS crisis to today. Uh, there were so many young people that you had oldest people talking, and we've changed our way of thinking about HIV and AIDS. So you had the younger generation and the newer generation kind of meeting and finding a midway point between the two. Okay, and once again, having uh, teaching more trans students right now, this was just very eye-opening to me for the 40 years of trans stories, that kind of thing where, ooh, I'd love to be able to bring that over here. I don't know if we have something that's that comprehensive mm -hmm. of what we've been doing. Uh, okay, all right. And so now we're gonna switch, us, and if you wanna see some of, here's the queer thinking in the festival program for that. You can look around, and then they had the LGBT Queer Film Festival, which was going on, so I was able to attend for about every night for a week to see the cutting edge films from around the world through their film festival. Uh, spectacular, so many of the uh, films that they're playing there, now a year later playing here in the United States. So you're able to do that, and they all have it at one theater as opposed to all over the city. So you go to one theater every night, and it's a big community. It's usually about three theaters at the same time. You have about 1,000 to 1,500 people that are waiting in line to see all the different films, and it's a sense of community for that. Uh, and then, I showed that one already, sorry. Uh, Curry Gras, uh, the First Nation workshops, uh, calling all black queer artists, a series of creative development workshops, first people, queer performers, so they black Blackfoot, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I, maybe you know or don't know that before every performance and every sporting event in Australia, they uh, dedicate this performance to the First Nation people that they took their land from, and so it's an apology. And it was so funny, the first time seeing this was students, when they came up, they, what? They go, they did this once, at, and now some place in the United States are starting to do that. Mm -hmm. They'll just say, we're doing this, and it was that kind of thing. Maybe there may be performances that we want to do that at, to say, because now there's an app on your phone that says that University of Maryland College Park is on this Native, Native land, and it tells you the tribe and where they are. Mm -hmm. So it might be that kind of thing where a couple of shows we just think if it's appropriate, we put it in there, be in our announcement. Yeah, I bet the second season would love to start that one. Yeah, yeah. All right, and then, oh yeah, and so that was just the, the program that I can send anyone. So that was, uh, it just shows you one of the theater festivals that I attended. All right. Uh, all right, so go quickly. And then the last part of uh, my trip was going to Bali and taking workshops for myself. So uh, my first interest in Bali started when I was in college, and I needed one more uh, credit of performance class. <laughs> so I took a Balinese dance class because I thought it would be easy, and I was the only guy. It was so hard. Have you ever studied Balinese dance or no Balinese dance? And so yeah. after I started doing it, and I had some my sciatic stuff, and I think I might have did it over there. It's that kind of thing when you're starting. There, it's so specific, and every movement that you make and everything that you have to do means something. It's like Hawaiian dance, and you're sitting like this in these positions for so long. So I'm seeing Jaina right now. <laughs> Don't start doing that when you're 59. Uh, but what I learned from the Balinese dance workshops, now taking them again, uh, your typical day is you start out with yoga, mm -hmm. and then meditation, and then you eat as a group, mm -hmm. and then it'd be the first workshop, say in Balinese dance. And then you have lunch together, and you uh, meditate, and then I do gamelan, and gamelan is a music instrument that you're doing. And I go, oh, 
So they relax before every workshop, where we do a little check-in. In our acting class, we do our relaxation, but we really don't get people down on the ground unless we're doing a device show and say, we're all going to relax and we're all going to do yoga before we start, mm -hmm. which you would think is such a healthier way to do it. Then the next day uh, was batik painting. So it was the same way that Helen does a silk screening that you're doing, and then you go, oh, so as a culture there, they make their costumes, they make their masks, they, everything that they're going to be performing, they're doing. Mm -hmm. So everything is empowered. So then the next thing was mask carving. Mm -hmm. So then you're showing how to make it, and then you're cutting your fingers, and you're bleeding, and you're realizing, you know, one week isn't quite the ideal time to do this. This is more of a taste of what you're doing. Uh, and then puppetry. And once again, it's not, oh, sorry, just uh, doing pu Then you got to make your puppets. And as you know, they've done this. And then, uh, the last thing was choral chanting. Mm -hmm. So learning that, and kind of what you and Lisa do in your class with a voice, this is all part of it. So for me, doing the workshops in Balinese performance, it really reinstated why we do what we do, but sometimes we just do a, a taste of it, where they live in it. And once again, you realize island time. Mm -hmm. Everyone slows down, everyone eats together, Everyone relaxes together, and then at the end of the night, you're going to bed at 7 o'clock, you know, because you've had a whole day, you know, of what you're doing, and you're supposed to meditate before you go to bed, and then you start the same thing again. And there really wasn't a performance. You were performing all the time. Yeah. So I know I'm out of time for this, but then I want to spend time with anyone that has questions about my experience. There. It sounds fabulous. I'm so envious. <laughs> Yeah. Um, oh, thank you for IPCCR uh, for giving us these experiences. I wonder if we couldn't have like some exchange. I I worked with some Balinese vocalists at a conference. You know, to have them here for some sort of a residency, or yeah. if if any of the contacts you made in like Bali get them here, because I think the thing that I got most out of the Balinese dance and mm -hmm. movement and voice was the fact that it is uh, there's no difference between any ceremony that they have and theater. The theater is part of their religion, it's part of the way they live, and that the gods are very real to them for bringing them in. And it's a it's kind of feels to me that some of the depletion that we feel as a culture is happening because we're not that present, mm -hmm. and wouldn't it be great if we could have a theater dance workshop for a week, you know, guests for a week and a, a series of classes that the students have the opportunity to do that culminated maybe them doing something, a, a bit of a talk or performance or something. And part of their culture is too, which it's almost like when you're traveling to different parts of Africa, I've been to, they're so poor. And their only business is tourism. Mm -hmm. There's no factories. There's no food. And everything that they do is for tourism. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was just, you see, in Kenya, you'll see the poorest of the poor, and then you'll see the richest of the rich, mm -hmm. which might be Kenyan still. But in Bali, it's just the poorest of the poor, and then tourists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you're supposed to barter, you know, for stuff. So I had some beautiful petite cloth that I bought back, and it's like, maybe it was 10 American dollars. And they want you to, no, that would be way too much. It's probably $2, you know, for, and you're supposed to barter $1. And I go, no, like, that's their weekly, $10 like a month for them. So you feel, when you're in those kind of countries, it's like, we're so fortunate. We're so entitled, but I've never been to a place like Bali where it's, all working class, and then the tourists that come in. Because usually you'll see the rich Ghanaians or the rich, but this is, I didn't really see, there's not rich Balinese that you see. Because then in all the restaurants, and that are not owned by the Balinese. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but
but yeah, and it'd be great maybe starting here, finding in our local area, do we have any Balinese artists? And then embrace them, and then to try to figure out how we do it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. And I should have brought. I was going to bring that in because I have a shadow puppet that I that I was able to, to bring in. Question of the class. Thank okay. you so much, and and we'll get together and talk. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank